So I think I should begin with a public service announcement. I do not have COVID, at least so far. If you were here last week or if you joined us online, uh, you will know that we had some guest preachers, Father Jim Richards, Archbishop Martin Curry. We're very grateful for them. I was away on vacation, and, and Father Alex was scheduled to be here for the first Holy Communions. By the way, congratulations to all of the, the young people and to your families on your first Holy Communion. But unfortunately, Father Alex got COVID on Easter Sunday night. And so he and the whole household, they got taken out. And uh, eventually Deacon Ronan got it. And as soon as they all found out they had COVID, they, they immediately uh, went into isolation. And I'm happy to say they're all recovering well. Father Alex is fully recovered. He's been recovered for, for uh, almost a full week now. But uh, at the height of it, I reached out to Father Alex in the middle of my vacation, because I'm a good brother, you know. I was like, how you, how you doing, man? How are the symptoms? And he said, well, you know, like, I'm feeling a little bit tired. Like, I kind of feel compelled to take a nap. <laughs> and so, you know, quite concerned, uh, we found out, this is, just to, to share with you, this is a picture of Father Alex before he got COVID. So this is him in the chapel, morning prayer, uh, wrapped up in a blanket like a burrito, fast asleep. And uh, this is a picture of him w after he got COVID. <laughs> so anyways, we're, we're praying for you, Father Alex, uh, <laughs> as you continue to recover. So for my, my homily now. I'm reminded of a story when I was in seminary of a time, you know, I was studying to become a priest and we were up uh, doing some of our formation at a place called Assumption Farm, two hours west of Ottawa. And it's this beautiful place, but in the dead of winter, it feels a little bit more like Alcatraz. And so there's any excuse to, to get out. We're, most of us in our early 20s, so we're like overgrown teenagers, basically. But there was this one guy who was in his 50s. He was a lawyer, actually a partner in a major firm on the West Coast, and he was exploring the possibility of, of priesthood. And so I can't remember the occasion, maybe it was Easter, but we went to town for Chinese food. And I don't know if this has ever been your experience, you go to a restaurant and you kind of think, uh, somebody is going to pick up the tab, and I think we were hoping that he was going to treat us, this lawyer seminarian. And so, you know, I did what I do every time, I get to mealtime, I eat like it's my last meal, like I'm on death row or something, you know? And so I'm gorging myself with egg rolls and chicken balls and sweet and sour pork, you know, all the authentic dishes. And finally, the bill comes around, and this one guy, the lawyer seminary, he puts up his hand to take it, and I just think, yes, this is what I hoped for. And then he turns to us, there's a group of about 10 of us, and he said, hey guys, if you, if you want to chip in, you know, five or ten dollars, that would be great. And so I myself, uh, you might know this, I left a lucrative career as a lifeguard to become a priest. And so I reached into my wallet and pulled out a crisp ten dollar bill and tossed it on the table, you know. Uh, but I have to admit, there's a part of me that was asking the question, well, why do you want me to contribute? <laughs> You know, you're rich, you can, you can easily handle this. But as I reflected on it later, I thought it was brilliant. You know, this moment where, yes, he could have covered the whole thing, but he included us in this, in this process. He wanted us to be part of it, involved. And I think another analogy today that's quite common, the principle of allowance. Right, I, I myself didn't grow up with an allowance, but... It's, it's quite common for parents to give their kids, you know, a certain amount of money uh, as their, maybe once a week, as their allowance. I think when I was growing up, it was something like $2 a week was the going rate. But now due, due to hyperinflation, there's child lobby groups who've been pushing to increase that, as I understand. What's the point? It's to teach children how to, how to use money. You can use money, you can give it away, you can save it, you can spend it. And often is the case, uh, uh, 
a child might want something, like a candy bar, and their parent will take them to the store, drive them to the store, they'll pick out the one they want, and they, they go to pay for it with their allowance. Now imagine if that same child, uh, they get to the cash register, and, and they're like, well, why do you want me to contribute? You're the parent, you have all the money, and it's true, right? The parent has all the, they, they even gave the allowance in the first place. They spent probably more on gas, uh, especially now, driving to and from the store. And yet, the parent wants the child to contribute something, to be part of it. And I think this dynamic, dynamic exists between parents and children. It also exists between God the Father and us, his children. It's like he's provided this allowance to us to teach us about money, and he asks us to contribute something. And we see this at play in our gospel. So it's after the resurrection. These disciples, they've already met Jesus a couple times, this risen Jesus, and yet uh, they decide, Peter and a group of seven, seven of them, they decide to go fishing. And I'm not sure why, I don't know what their motivation was, but it could be they had spent these last three years with Jesus, who was is, who is there, they depended on him, they learned to rely upon Jesus. And it's like, yeah, sure, he's risen from the dead, but he's kind of, he appears, he disappears, he appears, he disappears. It's like, can we really count on Jesus? Maybe we should just make sure to provide for ourselves. And they default back to this self-reliance. We're going to go fishing and be sure to provide. And so they go out. As, as the story goes, they, they, they're out all night. They catch nothing. And then Jesus from the shore calls them to cast their, their nets on the other side. And they, they bring in this huge haul of fish, more than they could ever need. And it's John, the beloved disciple, who sees it is the Lord. As if to say he has this revelation that is God, that is Jesus is the one who provided this humongous, overabundant catch. And here's the part that struck me. Jesus is on the beach, and he's already got a fire going. He's already got fish cooking on the fire. He's already got bread. And so, you know, he says to these guys, he's, he's, Obviously, he's prepared a picnic basket to feed these clowns breakfast already. And yet, when they get to shore, what does he say to them? Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. You don't have to bring all the fish, but bring some of the fish that you've just caught. Now, Deacon Ronan was saying he was reading an Irish Bible commentary. And you know, you know how there's, there were 153 fish well, the disciples, in order to make that 10% tithe, they brought over 15.3 fish to Jesus. He made that up. But uh, here's the point. It's like Jesus, he doesn't need any of their fish. He's already got breakfast cooking. He's the one who provided the giant catch anyways in the Sea of Galilee. And yet... He asks them to contribute something. And I think if I could summarize uh, the, the point, I would say this, this little syllogism. God provides everything. He asks us to contribute something so that we can help provide for someone. Just say that with me. God provides everything he asks us to contribute something so that we can help provide for someone. God provides everything. He asks us to contribute something so we can help provide for someone. We're in this series. We're calling it Provision, and it's all about uh, God's provision for us. And every, every year, if you're new here, you might not know this, but every year we do an annual preaching series on giving. And some people are, are surprised by that, that we're talking about money uh, at church. 
But I want to take a moment and just explain why. And here's four quick reasons why we talk about money. First of all, we see it as a spiritual reality. It's something that's at the heart of being a disciple. A disciple is somebody who gives generously. And so much so that we, we presented our new game plan a few months back, and right on the game plan, we say part of being a disciple is somebody who prays and gives at Mass. So that's the first reason. The second is that we realize that there are always new people here, and so we don't want to presume that people know what to do or, or why we do these things. So we want to take the time to explain. Another reason is for the sake of unity, that every single person, what you bring, it matters. Your contribution makes a difference. And I think one thing that makes our parish so special is that it's not just a church about one person or about a small group of people who are doing everything, but that everyone is involved. Everyone contributes. And what you contribute matters. And finally, generous people means that we can be a generous parish. And last year, at around this time, we made this bold decision that we were going to be generous as a parish, that we were going to start working towards tithing, giving away 10% of our regular income to people in need, particularly in our own community. And there's so many needs, we wanted to help make a difference. And I figured, you know what, in that first year, maybe we'd give away 5%, and then in the next year, maybe we'd give away 7%, and we'd start to build up towards it. But I am pleased to announce that last year, we gave away $112,000. Just give yourselves a round of applause. That's, that's incredible. That works out to 9%, 9% of our overall regular income last year. And this year, we built it right into the budget so that we're planning to give away the full 10% to people who are truly in need. And so I guess my request for you today is, is pretty simple. We're going to be in this preaching series for, for two more weeks, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to stay dialed in. Stay tuned in. Don't try to change the channel. I know this can be a, an uncomfortable topic uh, at times, and, and yet it's so important. It's part of what it means to be a disciple. And, and we're going to be talking in the coming weeks about how you can respond to contribute something to this whole mission of our parish. And you might just spend a bit of time even this week trying to reflect on my, my not-so-witty syllogism. God provides everything. He asks us to contribute something so that we can help provide for someone. And speaking of helping to provide for someone, I want to share one story about someone who's been truly blessed by your giving. And it's, you can read about it next week. We're going to give out these magazines, the Stewardship of Treasure magazine. But I wanted to give you a sneak peek because this story is, is so amazing. So let me introduce you to Tina. She, she says, I want to share about SBP Cares, this, this ministry that gives away the, the 10%, how SBP Cares literally saved my life. I'm a solo parent of a beautiful six-year-old daughter whose father passed away as a result of substance abuse when she was one year old. I have also struggled with substance abuse, but can proudly say I am clean and sober and living a happy, healthy life. However, the desperate place that I was in when I connected with SPP Cares was unlike anything else I had ever dealt with. So she'd been working in the restaurant industry, and because of COVID, she lost her job. She said, by November of 2021, I had reached a level of hopelessness that I had never experienced before. Now, she reached out on Facebook for help, and she got some, some initial help. She says, this was an incredible blessing, but it didn't solve my ongoing financial struggles or give me any hope for the future. 
I was in a very dark place. Then I received a message from a dear friend who was a parishioner at St. Benedict Parish. She wanted to know how she could help. At that time, I was days away from losing my spot in childcare and potentially having my power cut off as both bills were unpaid. By the end of the week, this parishioner had raised enough money to cover my childcare costs, plus put a dent in my power bill. I couldn't believe it, but she wasn't done. She referred me to SBP Cares, and after one conversation with one of the wonderful team members, I finally had hope for the future. SBP Cares helped me in so many ways, and I can never put into words how much gratitude I have. They provided financial assistance, Christmas gifts, grocery gift cards, and perhaps even more importantly, so much emotional support. They're not one and done, but want to build relationships with those they assist. I fell on some hard times, as many did during the pandemic. I did not see a way out. I could not provide for my daughter, and I felt like a failure in so many ways. I can say with certainty that if SPP Cares was not there to pull me out of the water while I was drowning, I would not have held on much longer. My daughter still has a mother, thanks to the generosity and support of SPP Cares, and for that, I am forever grateful. We've heard already a few dozen stories like Tina's, thanks to your generosity. And I dream of a day when we have hundreds, thousands of stories like this because of the impact of your giving. Now, just to be clear, Tina says, you know, SPP Cares literally saved my life. I think we know the truth, that Jesus saved Tina's life, but we got to contribute something. That's how it works. God provides everything. He asks us to contribute something so that we can help provide for someone. 